All right. So I'd like to continue uh, after the break, and hopefully the others join us for uh, continuation. I have not left yet. Uh, we are here uh, with the third benchmark configurations uh, that to be is to be discuss discussed. However, uh, if there are any questions to what I have said before, uh, questions are welcome. So, not the case for the moment. So let's continue. Um, we have seen these uh, opposed jet as a relatively simple system concerning the flow field. We have added complexity by uh, recirculation and swirl and have as well briefly discussed the uh, phenomenon of flashback. Uh, the next level of complexity would then be to go really to a pressurized flame. So what you have seen in the previous examples are extracts that are uh, mimicking certain aspects of a gas turbine combustion. Now, um, of course, to come closer to reality, um, you need this kind of enclosure. And uh, that can be looked at uh, in different ways. For example, non-premixed natural gas flames or even spray flames, but as well uh, premixed flames. Um, so what I'm going to show here is something like an intermediate step to uh, the big facilities that at least in Germany are operated at the DLR in Cologne and Stuttgart, uh, where they have uh, more funding to do uh, more than single nozzle combustion. Here, uh, we try to stay relatively cheap to, to say below a thousand euro per measurement day compared to DLR where you maybe pay up to 150,000 per day. Yeah, And that makes a difference, um, especially if you have funding through the National Science Foundation. So we try to come up with a modular setup. Uh, you need a pressure housing. You need uh, the flame tube, which is optically accessible. I will discuss that. Uh, if you don't do that in, t uh, in a good design, you might lose a lot of money by replacing your uh, pressure windows. And then you need a complex infrastructure. And the infrastructure uh, contains a pressurized air supply. Uh, you need to heat that air because in gas turbine combustion, of course, you have the compressor and uh, your uh, combustion chamber is fed with air at the order of, let's say, 700K. Uh, as well, you need pressurized fuel supply. And because of cost reasons, uh, at least us, we restrict to natural gas, where you need an extra compressor for, or you operate it with liquids, uh, for example, N-heptane uh, to uh, have a fuel, a surrogate, that is not as complex as kerosene, like for aero engines, uh, because of the uh, interferences you might end up with in your spectroscopy. Then you need a good exhaust gas after treatment, because you have a pressure regulation valve, which should not be overheated. But once that is solved, that is, in the end, easier than having an open flame because you can e more easily control uh, your heat losses. And of course, you should make sure that your safety equipment is such that you can prevent uh, any harms to your uh, operators. All right, here you see a structure that you have built up over the years uh, where you have here uh, the region of interest. That is our flame tube, single nozzle uh, with optical access from three sides which is operated uh, with either liquid or gaseous fuels, where you have here from coming from an air compressor uh, system uh, preheater uh, in the order of 40, 50 kilowatts, such that we can heat up uh, 150 grams per second with a uh, temperature of up to 700 K or so. Uh, then you need uh, air to cool the system, because here is the uh, pressure valve that takes uh, uh, or that creates the pressure inside the, the vessel here. And we have here an exhaust system where we, and that's the most important part, where we spray in water uh, and uh, thereby cool the exhaust gases to temperatures below 700K or 650K, which is the operation limit of that uh, nozzle over here. Uh, here you see uh, a design that is already uh, a couple of years old. We have now a, a different one. But the idea is to have something like a can combust concept. A single nozzle, which is fed through uh, this plenum over here where you have the preheated uh, air um, and where you have here the fuel supply. The green areas, they, they denote the, uh, the windows. And that is uh, the idea of the concept to decouple the mechanical stress, the pressure difference, atmospheric outside, inside the maximum of 10 bar. So the mechanical stress is decoupled from the thermal stress. That's why we have a three windows concept where you see over here 
the window that takes the heat or which is exposed directly to the flame, that is relatively thin and there is almost no pressure difference such that the cooling air uh, goes this way and is then guided uh, uh, along this inner window by having a window in between. So this three windows concept proved to be very reliable and actually we never had any failure with the pressure window. And here we're talking about a window of that size. It's rather expensive. You have uh, something like 30, 40 millimeters in thickness, uh, fused silica uh, with good optical quality as well for UV radiation. Uh, and that is something you would not like to break for cost reasons and uh, because of safety, of course. Um, yes, please. I'm just curious, is fused silica the best material you could use for these windows? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, I, I think, yeah, yeah. I, I think that's. Um, um, real, maybe sapphire is as well a choice. Uh, I'm, I haven't informed myself about the price of these sapphire windows, but that might be as well a choice, okay. yeah, depending on the budget. Did you have to go to a clearing Did you have to use clear oh, no. uh, Yeah, it's, it's really, if you, go, if you go in the UV, for example, what you currently do is CO measurements, and CO is excited to photon at 230, and if you there have low quality quartz, you're in trouble. And if you heat it up, uh, then you're in trouble as well because your transmission curve shifts further red. And that's why, especially deep in the UV, you really have to spend some money. And, and these windows have to be replaced regularly because they, they have seen heat uh, and in the deep UV, uh, they lose their characteristics after a the time. These are actually fused silica, aren't they, rather than quartz synthetic silica? It is synthetic, yes. Oh, wow. It's synthetic. The natural quartz is not good enough. Yeah. yeah, you have OH groups and that makes it for the UV very difficult. You have to look for good suppliers, uh, which are reasonable in price and reliable. Okay, having here then three optical component or three optical excesses means that you can send in, for example, your laser in, laser out, and for example, fluorescence. Uh, okay, there's another question. Uh, sorry, one other question about the windows. Uh, you mentioned that it's hard to use sapphire to go to fuse silica. Does the bioprojects cause problems with the laser when you use sapphire windows? Possibly, yes. It can happen. Uh, th that, that, that might be, uh, if you're depending on the polarization, might be anyhow a problem. Whenever you have any mechanical stress, even on a few silica window, uh, you, can, you can observe a change in the polarization. And so uh, that can cause trouble, uh, for example, in, in those techniques relying on that, like in cars or polarization spectroscopy, things like that. It, 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 is, uh, it is a possible influence. Yeah. Okay. Um, by that time, we have chosen this design as well because we are interested in spray flames. And then for phase double anemometry, it was better to have not a direct uh, opposing uh, exit, although that has been changed uh, because of the ugly shape we ended up with the flame tube over here. So uh, these kind of investigations are, of course, driven more uh, by as well industrial um, perspectives. And that's why we have, uh, to a certain extent, looked at uh, nozzles closer to real nozzles, like this Airblast nozzle. It's uh, maybe a couple of years ago that people were interested in that. But this was a very uh, difficult problem because a lot of the physics actually takes place inside the nozzle. You have here a conical spray and you form a, a film that is transported by a shear. You have here the inlet of the air, an inner swirled flow and an outer swirled flow and the inner one drives the film to this edge over here and then you create droplets depending on the film diameter or the film thickness and you have then dispersion of the droplets in the field with the other uh, swirl, uh, swirled air. And here, if you're interested in flame stabilization, you already have pre-mixing inside the nozzle. And so having optical access to that nozzle would be very, very good. We tried that, but in the end, more or less failed. Yeah. So. That's why, as well, industry was uh, interested in systems that are mimicking important aspects but are not as close to reality. You see here from a European project uh, a fuel supply that was by that time natural gas, avoiding the second phase. It was more in the early times of large eddy simulation where people uh, had a, a restricted confidence in, 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 in two-phase flows. And you see here as well, it's a single nozzle that's actually a, a, a design from a French uh, gas turbine company building helicopter gas turbines. And the experts uh, among you might see here something really strange. Typically you have here a diffuser type shape, but by that time, uh, large eddy simulation grids were not able to take complex formed, meaning that it was a, a, a diffuser type. That's why we ended up with a rectangular thing. And that 
directly shows you need the contact to the people from the CFD. Because if you build something and they can't do it with a grid, for example, it might be uh, not as useful as it could be if you have talked beforehand. And so uh, here again, you see uh, something like a flame sequence. In that case, we have changed the pressure for constant combustion temperature, uh, air temperature, and fuel temperature. Uh, and you see here, due to pressure, we have much higher Reynolds numbers now. We are talking about more than 100,000. And this, of course, becomes more realistic. On the one hand side, on the other side, of course, you're losing uh, the capability to uh, resolve all scales. You somehow filter, uh, and that is very often not very well defined. A visual impression, um, you see here the pressure housing with the window. Uh, the window, as I said, is in the order of 30 centimeters from here to here. Uh, here you see partly the nozzle. Uh, a bluish flame, of course, you can operate it as well differently. Uh, here with a certain amount of pre-mixing by a, or a pilot operating, and then it becomes sooty. And what you see here as well, that is a view graph you might not have in your, uh, because I added it yesterday uh, in your um, printouts. Uh, that is a system where we are interested as well in effusion cooling, where you see over here uh, that uh, the lower uh, base is equipped with uh, um, a plate where you have many holes where effusion air is coming out. And uh, that is an impression more recently where we currently apply cars and CO simultaneously to measure in these flames. And uh, you see all the problems you might end up with reflections. Yeah? That is a YAG laser. And there is as well some red coming from the Stokes laser. We have to discuss that, how it works. But uh, you see that uh, reflections uh, actually cause problems. Here you see back to the spray flame. Uh, chemiluminescence imaging, although this is done here with 10 kilohertz, there is no uh, temporal correlation. So really measuring time series where you can correlate image to image uh, at these high Reynolds numbers becomes relatively difficult. And now we're talking about maybe 100 kilohertz or even more that you need to come up with uh, sequences to better understand this fluctuation. Yeah, you see, this is a lifted flame, but eventually it goes uh, back and forth. It's not very stable uh, by this high speed. By eye, it looks perfectly stable. But uh, understanding what's going on here with these oscillations, uh, that is still something uh, that is, uh, needs even faster diagnostics. Yes, please. Can you say no time correlation based on the turbulence or the flame dynamics? That is uh, primarily based on the turbulence. Uh, but of course, that influences the flame dynamics. The flame follows uh, to a certain extent to the flow field, but as well, of course, uh, has a certain uh, uh, transfer characteristics and is, is, is behaving differently. Yeah? Uh, but, but primarily, it's the high Reynolds numbers. So you might be able to capture the large scale dynamics. Yeah, but even here, the large, the, what is a large scale? A large scale is something to me where you have, for example, the leading edge of the flame. And eventually, it shoots up and it's gone. And so if you have a, 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 a correlation, then you would see what is happening. It's a swirling flame, and I would expect, and if you go for 100 kilohertz or so, that you see what is uh, the transition from here to here and back. And that is not seen. And uh, as well, if you uh, look for, for example, if you perform flow field measurements, you take, uh, you have to use high speed PIV anyhow, because after a couple of seconds, all your windows might be covered and you can't look through anymore. Uh, and if you then go and look for, let's say, a temporal autocorrelation, uh, you directly find that the correlation value goes uh, uh, close to zero very fastly within, I don't know, one or two exposures, and that's not sufficient to resolve it. And so based on that, I can say that our repetition rate is not good enough to really follow uh, to get these sequences resolved. And the same holds true uh, for the spatial resolution. So uh, you might be able to see the larger structures, but flame structures, of course, you would not. And that, that is uh, especially under pressure, where everything gets thinner and thinner. That's a limitation. And so looking, for example, for flame structures and for premix flames at uh, high fluctuation levels, so meaning in the regime diagram far up, under pressure, it will be even more difficult. Yes. That is, uh, a Reynolds number is, um, we typically define them as nozzle exit Reynolds numbers, uh, where you have, um, um, it's a dimensionless number. You know the definition, okay. or, okay, okay. Uh, you have, uh, 
destabilizing forces over uh, stabilizing forces. And um, uh, the higher uh, the destabilizing forces are, the higher the Reynolds number is. And that is uh, basically based on a given length scale and based on a certain uh, viscosity, uh, the, the bulk flow rate, if you take the uh, uh, Reynolds number in its original definition and not the turbulent Reynolds number. And uh, that means the higher the flow rate, the higher the flow velocity, the higher the Reynolds number. And uh, the more the flow rate, the more fuel can be uh, burned. And that means uh, if you go for a certain thermal load, let's say you're aiming for a combustor that has, I don't know, 10 megawatt or something like that, uh, you will have not only a single nozzle, but maybe multiple nozzles, okay, but each nozzle will be fed by a relatively high flow rate. And that's why uh, the real combustors oper operated uh, at these uh, higher Reynolds numbers. And they are difficult to handle in the lab um, because of the thermal load. Uh, and uh, that's why uh, we have always this, let's say, um, a trade-off be between coming closer to reality and uh, being handleable and affordable. Coming, if you go into this uh, 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 theory more, then you will see that the length scales as well scale uh, with the Reynolds number. We come to that later, I think, in the velocimetry chapter, you'll see it. And there um, you find that the scales are began, depending on the Reynolds number, getting smaller and smaller. And that means if you have a certain probe volume size, let's say your, your diagnostics can resolve, let's say 100 by 100 by 100 micrometer, micrometer which would be already very good, uh, then uh, the small scales might be less than 10 microns, and then you're measuring something which is filtered. So the subscales, there is some substructure which cannot be resolved. Yeah? For example, if this is the size of your probe volume and in between your flow field or your mixing or so is doing that, you wouldn't recognize that. So it's filtered. And the problem is that you do not know exactly the filter function. And the problem is as well that people from the CFD side filter differently. And then uh, you might have filtered quantities which are compared to each other uh, and have different meanings. And so although this is a common practice, that is maybe not the best way to do it. Okay? Yeah, oh. You do your autocorrelations by taking them, by recording the measurements and then subsequently post processing it. Correct. Okay. Okay, more recently, effusion cooling. That is one of the primary problems uh, in uh, lean premix combustion because uh, a lot of air is going through the nozzle uh, and such that you have. Um, depending, of course, on the bypass. In, in civil air engines, you have a large bypass, that you have less and less cooling air. Um, and so you need an eff efficient cooling. And people do that now uh, by having here effusion cooling plates composed of many, many, many holes, 20, 30 degree, very small. And uh, the uh, premixed flames are then attaching to this area where you have this film cooling, which has not really been investigated in depth. And so you see here, uh, for this uh, combustor, uh, a piloted premix flame, a lean premix flame, uh, where you see the single nozzle. Here is the effusion cooling plate, and uh, the these type of flames actually spread widely because of the swirl number ar around one, uh, such that you have here a strong interaction between the flame, the wall, and the effusion cooling, and uh, that needs more attention. And so we uh, uh, redesigned this rig to have here now. Uh, a nozzle where we as well can change the swirl number and then have here the effusion cooling plate and have then access through these three windows and uh, have looked into flow field, uh, the flame brush. You can see here the structures of OH imaging, a technique to be explained where you have uh, a strong variations in intensity of OH and you find all kinds of thicknesses uh, which is uh, very, very different from all these more well-behaved flames at lower Reynolds numbers and at atmospheric pressures. And so uh, in addition to that, uh, you can as well measure temperatures by cars with a given resolution and as well the wall temperatures close to this or at this effusion plate are very important. And that's why um, we have as well to talk about phosphor thermometry in this lecture series later this week. Some impressions about it uh, to give some appetite about what you can do with these techniques. You find here, uh, uh, an averaged velocity field with the streamlines where you have here to the left uh, somewhere the nozzle without and with pilot and you see here uh, are the exits of the effusion cooling plate where you see uh, the flow going out and interacting 
with that uh, of the of the main, um, and you see uh, that the pilot actually makes a difference in the overall features uh, to be uh, to be seen here by direct, direct comparison. Interesting as well, as I said, is to look for the wall temperatures because the aim, of course, is to protect the wall for overheating uh, without taking too much of um, mass flow through this effusion cooling. So each of these holes is here in that case, I think two millimeters in an industrial project, it was in the order of 0.7 millimeters and you have a certain inclination, 20 to 30 degree. And then uh, this phosphor thermometry allows you really precise and accurate measurements of the temperature, which is color coded over here with the mean and the fluctuations. And uh, you see here the holes, um, forget the information from them, but you see downstream from the holes, uh, you have actually a cooling of the wall so this is a, a couple of 10 Kelvin lower than the surroundings. And you see as well by this inclination that there is some swirl imposed. That's why uh, they are not directly going in the axial direction, but they as well have a radial direction. And interestingly as well to see, maybe not astonishing, uh, is that the fluctuation of the temperature is in the order of a couple of, uh, in the order of 10 Kelvin, with maybe the precision of the technique in this case being something like three Kelvin. So you see there is not too much fluctuation for a given operational uh, point. Okay, any questions to that part? Yes, please. Uh, what's the temporal resolution? It uh, depends on the phosphor. Uh, we will see that, that you have phosphors with, based here we use decay time. So uh, after a very short excitation using something like five nanoseconds in the UV, you're looking for the decay of the phosphor. Uh, and uh, for that phosphor, I think, I'm not I have to look that up. Um, it's in the order of uh, maybe a couple of hundred microseconds. Oh yeah, up to maybe a couple of hundred microseconds for that. But to be sure, I have to look that up, uh, honestly. Um, that is uh, because of the thermal inertia good enough. The thermal inertia of that wall is, is high. And that's why for wall temperature measurements and gas turbines, I would say it's not so critical. I have more an eye on it when you go to uh, investigations in IC engines where you have intermittent combustion and where you have a flame that is, it's a different kind of flame wall to action, isn't it? It comes, gets closed, and it's, uh, of course, then quenched, and you have a peak load, and then it's gone. And there you need a higher resolution in time. Okay, a few words about benchmark experiments devoted to IC engine combustion. Anyone doing IC engine combustion over here? Okay, it's worth doing that. <laughs> All right. Uh, in Germany, uh, our politicians from the Green Party think in 2030 it will be over and no new engine will be allowed. Uh, only by that time then uh, everything has been uh, finished in terms of research. <laughs> Who knows? I don't know how they want to, I don't know how they want to do it with transportation of uh, heavy loads, but you will see. You say there's no simplified generic engine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that is for fuel properties. Oh. Yeah, but okay. Okay, what, what, what I'm after is here that you have a um, trade-off between power, efficiency, and emission. That would be the same uh, chart from GM, I guess. Yeah, you would have here a similar chart. Uh, that is influenced by combustion, and of course combustion itself is influenced by all these different things like a complex flow field, a complex mixture preparation, ignition, and flame propagation. And in that case, I cannot really think of a simplified geometry that takes into account all of these. Yeah, well, of course, we need to uh, understand mixture preparation, for example, in, in idealized experiments, like a bomb experiment, where you have then an, uh, an injector and look that in independently of, let's say, the flow field. But in the end, uh, it turns out, whenever you do some small variations in the engine inlet, for example, you're talking about a stratified engine where GM as well tried to come to the market with, and you make a small change at the inlet geometry and you have a different behavior in cycle variations. How to mimic that in a canonical system? So at least my, my view presently is that uh, there is not really a simplified generic configurations if you want to account for this complex interaction uh, in intermittent combustion. And so um, you see here a system uh, from AVL, it's one of the providers uh, out of maybe five worldwide, uh, where you have optical access from the side, 
and you have optical access, you will see in a sketch in the second uh, through the uh, piston where it's equipped with, um, with uh, a window as well. And so here is uh, the system uh, using a cylinder head which is more or less commercial, but where we are allowed to take the CAD drawings and, and send it to our partners. Uh, what is very different is the inlet and the outlet. And so again, the idea when I decided to do that um, on our own, um, it was triggered by the fact that there was not a good comprehensive set of data for co cooperation with people from LAS. And so we decided to do it on our own because uh, what I've seen on the market was then either statistically not very reliable data or very often no access to the cat drawing and maybe even worse, not very, very well defined boundary conditions. So the idea is to have here straight tubes equipped with sensors starting with a large volume where you can, even if you have here intermittency, where you have a large enough volume such that uh, here you have constant thermodynamic conditions as well as the exhaust and a very simple geometry and all of these parts are laser sintered so we have a full knowledge about uh, the geometry. Okay, and so that allows us in the single cylinder to do some, I think, very nice work. You see more about the engine over here. It's a half liter, relatively large bore and stroke. Important, a reduced compression rate. Uh, at least for European standards, typically you would have here at least uh, 10 uh, or more. Uh, the problem is that you have uh, your piston rings because of the optical excess in the piston rather far down. And that's why you do have um, uh, some, some large volumes uh, from the crevices. Okay, when we commissioned the system, it was uh, actually operating at 3,000 RPM with an IMAP from 10, of 10, but that's something I wouldn't like to repeat. It's frightening, uh, uh, I'm not sure how long it lasts. So typically we go up to 2,000 RPM uh, at, at, um, at maximum. And uh, of course the manifold pressure is variable. Important as well, you need a good seeding for particle image velocimetry. And interesting is as well, if you use, uh, of course you can use silicon oils with high uh, um, uh, point of evaporation, but we used as well bore not nitride particles, which are lubricants. And they work as well rather nicely, yeah? So people in Sandia have used, I think, sand. That is something I wouldn't do. <laughs> okay, here is a cross section to get a better idea for those of you who have not worked with engines, optical engines yet. Uh, that is a, a so-called extended bowdish piston where you have, I don't have a sample with me, uh, however you have here a hole in your crankshaft uh, um, uh, and then, uh, or in your housing and there is a lab fixed mirror such that you can either send a laser through or observe in the other direction. You would have here your optical uh, window in the piston and this is a design with an industrial partner where we have as well the real geometry in that piston. Uh, in our system it's only flat and the, the, the engine head over here with the optical liner uh, where you then have access up to the spark plug or the injector. Um, here you see a very straightforward system where we have looked for the uh, flow field with 16 kilohertz uh, with uh, a sufficient number of cycles to build up statistics. And I can tell you, you have a lot of problems doing that. You have a problem of scattered light. So you have to select your laser properly it's not only a high speed laser for those of you who are using that. You need to have a laser that is well behaved in terms of the M square, in terms of the beam profile. You want to have the light only in a small region. If you have a bad beam profile, you have much higher problems in, with scattered light off the surface because you shoot against the cylinder head. Yeah? And so that's, it's not only the, uh, the power or the repetition rate of the laser. Have a closer look at the M square. And it should be small in the order of maybe two that you can control where the light goes and then you can better control as well scatter, scattered light. You have uh, maybe not as worse, uh, as bad as in, in, in the gas turbine combustor, but contamination of the optical excess. You have to choose suitable PIV seeding particles because imagine now you have a constant flow coming in with a certain uh, seeding density and then you have compression. And then you, the number of seeding uh, or particles per volume is increasing. And so if you have solid seeding, they will not vanish. That can be a problem. And you might optimize your seeding for a certain crank angle degree range. 
or you choose the silicon oil such that the evaporation rate is um, somehow compensating that. Uh, that during compression, um, the seeding density is, is small, it's constant. And the uh, next point is uh, now you can, it's commercialized, uh, but depending on the flows, the, the, the velocities, you will see that when I explain PIV, for those who are not familiar with that, you have to select a certain distance between two exposures from which you uh, calculate by a cross-correlation your velocities. The in time interval between the laser illumination, between the laser pulses, is uh, dependent or must be chosen in dependence of your velocity because um, the dynamic range of PIV is not as large as you would wish. And that means that uh, if you're in the bottom dead center, you have low velocities, you need a large time separation between pulses. When you come to the, um, during compression to the top dead center, uh, then everything is faster and you need a small separation between pulses. And so during one cycle, if you do high speed imaging, you better uh, change uh, dynamically your temporal interval between pulses. And so for those of you who have not seen a uh, PIV image yet, you see here uh, a first exposure, and directly from that you learn how PIV uh, really works by visual inspection. Now you have a second, I go back and forth, and all what you have to do with your uh, mathematical algorithm is to calculate the most probable uh, pairs of particles between or in these two exposures, and that is all what PIV actually does. It is a lot of post-processing and knobs, and if you take the same data and two codes, you will not receive the same results. Um, that's why you have to be skeptic or, or, or uh, careful about it. But in the end, you get something like that. Uh, we will see more about it um, where all the spurious vectors have been removed. And for those uh, under you using that data in CFD, uh, reading a paper on PRV without stating how much of the spurious vectors have been smoothed away, don't believe them. Yeah, because it should be not more than 5% if possible, or at least it should be stated very clearly to understand the limitations. And so there's this uh, kind of post-processing, image post-processing, where uh, things can be hidden. So in the end, the best is to really look at the raw data. If your brain is not able to correlate, an algorithm will never be. And so uh, looking at the raw data, once again, is one of the most important things to, to trust the quality. Okay, and here's now an example to again make your appetite uh, for uh, the lectures uh, in the next days. Um, what you see here is uh, in the so-called tumble plane um, of this engine, uh, the velocity field you see over here, this is uh, the spark plug, the injector assembler here, and that is a stratified injection strategy from uh, a system uh, sold by Daimler in Stuttgart where they have multiple injections and are facing problems in cyclic variations. And uh, you see here now with the crank angle resolution, I think of one or two degrees, uh, this is an instantaneous cycle during compression. Uh, you see the vectors possibly and the magnitude is shown in red, high velocity magnitudes towards black, uh, low velocity magnitudes and we are now in the compression. I click through it uh, and eventually you see here the tumble center it's a very well-behaved flow field by intention. You have here this large-scale structure. Superimposed is uh, turbulence, which is not fully resolved, presumably. And so we go further in compression. Here is uh, now the piston surface. It is slightly curved because of that uh, design that has been chosen. And now you see the first injection. That is a holocone spray. And already here you see some problems. Um, you know it's a holocone spray. But what you see here is uh, a lot of me scattering of the droplets in areas it's cut through a holocone spray. There shouldn't be any signal. Yeah? That is one of the problems you're facing by multiple scattering, yeah? where you have to choose certain techniques to really resolve um, these kind of, um, or, 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 or avoid these kind of uh, artifacts over here. However, you see the spray. I have not been interested in the spray primarily. The spray induces turbulence. And that is the problem, and that, that was used then to solve the problem, or, or better understand what's going on in these engines. You see the spray has now created structures, vertical structures that are relatively large, and they, they survive for quite some time. They are now superimposed to the initial flow field. And now uh, they, of course, dynamically change their position, they decay and so on. And now there's coming the second injection, 
somewhere here. And from cycle to cycle, this injection will see different uh, flow fields because that is not stable. The injector, if you operate it in a constant volume, that's a perfect injector, every injection like the other. But superimposed with the flow field, things are getting unstable. And uh, uh, thereby, you can now understand, better understand what's going on with mixture preparation and so on, because uh, depending on what's going on here, you might have a good or less good a mixture uh, prepared for the subsequent uh, ignition. Okay, this gives you some idea, now I finished the cycle, um, where you can learn a lot about it, even though it is only the velocity field, only two components, but high speed uh, in a complex environment. You can do better, of course. If you have uh, um, uh, more laser power, you can try to measure volumetrically flow fields. And that has been achieved uh, uh, by using here uh, a laser that not only gives, let's say, a millijoule per pulse, but a couple of hundred millijoules, but only at low speed so far. Yeah? This is uh, restricted to one exposure per, per cycle. And then you have many cycles without any exposure and then the next. But you can, uh, as a benefit, get a volumetric idea about the flow field. And that can be helpful. Yeah? It can be helpful to better understand the uh, flow structures that build up. Uh, it comes on the expense not only of a more high power laser, but tomographic PAV means, like with your eyes, that you as well identify the position of the particles in a volumetric illumination in terms of their depths. Yeah, well, we can with our eyes because we have them uh, by something like 10 centimeters displayed from each other. Uh, we have a certain perspective and can, can identify with a certain resolution about the depths. And there is an optical angle, uh, an optimal angle between these cameras in the order of, let's say, 30 degrees. And you better use not only two cameras, but an advice is to use between four and eight cameras. In an engine, you can place only up to four cameras around it. And that's something like a compromise with a certain limitation with the resolution and the depth of field. And uh, as well, because of, of many constraints, I have no time to go into, into detail, the depth is only in the order of a couple of millimeters. And so you cannot expect to fully cover the full volume, but only a certain area over here. And to give you some first impressions, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about it later on. You can see here from instantaneous realizations, uh, the uh, isocontours of uh, velocity magnitudes. This is in the intake stroke, where to the left there would have been the intake valves. And that is something like a jet coming out uh, from each of these two valves, uh, where you have high velocities, uh, then, then it comes, uh, if this is uh, the inlet, it, it creates, because of the geometry, a, turbul, uh, a tumble motion, and it slows down, it further, it penetrates into the uh, cylinder volume. And uh, there as well now, it's interesting to visualize what's actually happening, and so uh, using, for example, uh, the Hund criterion, the Q criterion to look for areas where you have uh, vorticity, meaning the, the angular momentum dominating the strain. Uh, you can visualize actually uh, these turbine structures of the inlets jet. And it's nice to see that uh, if these uh, jets penetrate into the engine, they dissipate relatively fastly and uh, the turbines level is going really very, very fastly, uh, getting smaller and smaller. However, not at the boundary layer, at the, at the piston wall. So that's a very rich problem where you have, within time and space, a strong variation of your turbulence properties. OK, with that, I would like to conclude uh, about uh, this chapter, uh, where we have looked at the different benchmark configurations. So what I've shown and discussed was that it is useful that um, we are looking at systems with rising complexity and looking at different geometries. Whereas the optical assess in uh, atmospheric flames and uh, combustion systems is not a problem, in pressurized combustion it is a problem. And uh, as I discussed in terms of the gas turbine, you really come up with your own solutions uh, because there is nothing to my knowledge commercialized, which is different in IC engines. There are a number, a handful of companies that provide the optical access for you. Uh, although you pay quite a bit for that. Um, you need, in any case, a good characterization of the inflow and boundary conditions. And that is something I really 
uh, want to make a good point about it. Whenever you build up a system, take care about it. Take your time to design it, talk to people, talk as well to people from the CFD because you might use as well, although it's not, not really accurate, but you might use as well commercial programs to avoid or, or pre-design your nozzle, for example, to avoid uh, uh, pitfalls um, because uh, if you do that purely empirically, it takes a lot of effort and time and money. And so uh, that is my advice, especially here. That is a very, very important problem because all combustion systems are driven by the inflow. And if you have no control about the inflow, you might see interesting things, but you can't trace them back to a certain reason because um, of the maybe uh, not stable and repeatable inflow conditions. All right, that's about this chapter. Questions? Yes. Um, so what happens in the power stroke once both valves are closed? Because then they're closed down. So what happens in the power stroke? The power stroke, whenever you have now, uh, we're talking now about fired conditions. You have had a fuel, you have had a, uh, um, uh, maybe a spark ignition or something like that. And if you then use oil, the oil will burn. So you have, you have no, no chance to see then the um, flow field uh, after uh, the flame, ha flame has passed by. There you have to use solid seating. But uh, it really needs uh, a certain question that you're interested in the flow field in an engine after the flame has propagated. There are some questions about it, for sure, but uh, um, many of the, of the issues can be as well solved with, uh, without this uh, solid seating. So that's really uh, advanced. You need a good uh, seating generator because, um, as I said, you would not like to use any material you would like to have a specific material that will not destroy your engine. And uh, BN is a good, good, good choice, but um, it tends to stick to each other, uh, to the particles stick, and thereby uh, as well, it is not easy to control uh, the seating there. And you will do it only if you need it. And then uh, it is so much easier with silicon that uh, many questions can be solved with that, okay? For these engines, uh, that is a passenger car engine at, at scale. Okay. This is at scale, yeah. Um, even if you go uh, for, for ship engines, for example, like people in, in Denmark do, a, a colleague of mine is, is doing diagnostics there in a, in a, a heavy duty uh, a single cylinder ship engine with a bore of a meter and a stroke of, I don't know, it's huge, it's huge. And uh, there as well, they do it in the real scale. And I think that's the problem with IC engines. It's not easy to come up with a canonical geometry that includes all these aspects. Yep. Uh, is the injection transcritical for the IC engine? Say it again? Is the injection transcritical for the IC engine? It depends. Um, the, uh, let's say you have, of course, a fuel composition and you might have different components. If you restrict yourself, let's say, only to one component uh, in pressure, typically you're supercritical. But then for most of the fluids you inject, they, they then mix with uh, nitrogen and oxygen. Let's take only nitrogen for simplicity. And then uh, for most of the fluids, at least we are dealing with, is that then for the mixture, the critical conditions rise enormously. That you have a, uh, not really, if you have now a mixture of these two components, uh, then you're then you're transcritical uh, in even in terms of pressure. Yeah, in terms of, of temperature, uh, in mo at least those cases I have studied, actually, it's very difficult to achieve situations where you're really supercritical. Yeah, because of this mixture behavior of thermodynamics, um, and so I think. But even then, if you're not not really at supercritical conditions, you have situations where your surface tension is decreasing. And uh, in modeling, that has to be captured correctly. And that is not, not yet the, f the case, yeah. Okay, yes, please. Two questions about uh, flame mapping or seeing. Many engine combustion networks are built in a diesel diesel state. They need the oil streams in Paris and uh, in San Diego. Okay, so if you just can tell me how this system works, because the, 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 the carrier or the boundary conditions, they have to 
Yeah. The ECN engine combustion network is dealing more with sprays than with engines. So initially we have been initially or, or involved to that, but people there are really more about uh, diesel injection, but as well to a certain extent gasoline injection. They have as well model injectors for that, uh, where they very carefully look into these uh, uh, sprays. Um, and um, the connection in our case is that we're in, in discussion with them to use one of the ECN injectors in our engine. Uh, so far it failed because of geometrical restrictions, but uh, hopefully that, that might be overcome. Ideally, I would like to have for our two-phase systems actually an ECN injector because that would be so much cheaper uh, because we could simply take all the characterization from them and don't have to do it on our own. Okay? Yes, please. You will see uh, later on, I think, uh, an example where you can actually see uh, that from the crevices, the, the let's say, outgassing is, is coming in and changing the temperature and superimposing a flow field, which is really strong in, in terms of these optical engines where you have uh, a large distance between uh, the piston ring, the first piston ring, and the, and the piston um, uh, surface. Uh, yeah, you can see that. So you really like the oil? Uh, the oil. People have done that uh, in, in systems where they have had a, uh, I think this was made of sapphire, uh, a long elongated uh, window uh, where they uh, looked at the, at the oil looking from the side by fluorescence. Uh, that actually has been uh, done uh, by a company to my knowledge. Uh, they have as well had some, some publications about it. I have to look that up. But I remember a, a contribution at the Gordon Conference, for example, where they have uh, shown that. And there you could see as well the dynamics of the oil film, as far as I remember. But there it is uh, critical because you, you do have then uh, a, a system or an engine with, with oil operation, and ours is not, uh, where you um, uh, need uh, you know, well a, a different optical access. Yeah, it, it's not only uh, here you have metal and then, uh, and then quartz. In that case, you have metal all over the place, but there is a small stripe, a small window uh, that, that extends over the whole thing, and you have normal piston rings. Oh, right. Yeah, it's, yes, yes, and that's critical. I, I don't know the English word for that, but these, these uh, surfaces get a certain roughness, a controlled roughness. We call, call it honen. I don't know the English word for that. I'm sorry. Yeah, honen. And uh, it, is, it is really critical that, that you have these uh, uh, structures with the uh, window in place. And that, that is a lot of uh, empirical uh, t technology and knowledge how to do that. And so uh, I couldn't do it, but um, there are some people doing it. All right? Yes, please. Well, you have to uh, look at your viscosity as well. Um, uh, so it depends. Uh, but uh, uh, mm, so you're talking about which pressure range? Um, I could go with 16 bar. To 16 bar. Yeah. Well, you have you have to calculate it for your case uh, because I don't know which which fluid you're talking really about and how uh, viscosity. Uh, is changing with that, um, uh, but you have to stay then to, to be laminar, of course, below the critical value, which of course is as well dependent on a flow device. You can have laminar conditions up to maybe Reynolds exit run, uh, nozzle exit Reynolds numbers in the order of 4,000 without of even 5,000 if you have smooth surfaces. So uh, the best to look at is that you um, take uh, short exposure photographs of your flame and correlate the intensities from one exposure to the next and if there is uh, a high correlation, ideally one, for normalized values, then it's uh, not only laminar, but as well uh, statistically, or it's then it's as well stable. And uh, these, let's say, simple kind of investigations should be done in addition uh, to looking at the dimensionless numbers. Yeah, to be really prove that you're laminar and stationary. Because to my experience, it's very easy to make a laminar flame, make a flame stationary, 
that's quite an effort. Yeah. Okay. Um, that oil is uh, with a very high temperature and the highest we could find. The actual number might be wrong again, but the, the um, boiling point is, I think, in the order of 550, 600 Kelvin, something like that. Yeah, relatively high, but, but uh, I, I must refer uh, to, the, to the publications with that. You will find uh, the, the, um, the serial number of that oil, and then you have to look that up because I might mix up the numbers. For our compression ratio, it was, it was sufficient. If you go for a compression ratio of 11, it's maybe, depending on your, on your intake uh, uh, conditions, it might be not sufficient anymore. F but for this uh, rather low compression ratio, it was OK. Yes? Um, on the chart before this, do you know how they chose their two criterion thresholds, or was it just for Yeah, this is, this is uh, a bit of empirical. Um, that is what you're after. Uh, of course, uh, what you see here is uh, based on this uh, definition uh, adapted to the engine uh, with some more um, scaling. You find here uh, Q values between 700 and, and 1000. Um, and there you see then, of course, different structures. And so uh, this kind of visualization always is a bit arbitrary and depends on what you're, what you're after. And so in this case, I wanted to see actually um, the differences between the uh, areas where you have a big impact of the intake flow and where it has dissipated to that flow that later on makes up the tumble. Did you look at any other ovarian or vagina? Yeah, we looked into that. There is as well literature uh, about it from different people, and uh, I don't know what is the best. I think uh, the Q criterion is doing uh, what to visualize what you want to see, but there are other ways to do it for sure. There is no the best solution to it. Okay. Yeah, well, it's already another hour. That's frightening. Uh, okay. What about having a break? Uh, now, maybe you come back at uh, uh, 11.20. Is that okay? A bit shorter than the, lo the last one. Um, it's good that you have many questions, but I think later on towards lunch, if you're getting hungry, we shouldn't extend it then more than five, five minutes or so uh, over time. And so see you then in 11.20. Uh, uh,